anyone have? Oh, it just turned to three. So shall I begin? All right. Uh, welcome to uh, today's panel, Bees and Roses. Uh, we will be discussing uh, Marion Wong, the curse of Guanggung, when the Far East mingles with the West. Uh, here is our brief program overview. We are joined first by uh, Professor Gregory Mark, uh, who is the grandson of Violet Wong, the star of the film, and the grand nephew of Marion Wong, the director, producer, auteur. Uh, he will be talking about such topics as Chinese diaspora, uh, contemporary depictions of Asian people in the media, uh, Marion and Violet Wong as people, uh, the Wong family tree, and how the film came about. Uh, then following him will be Yan Fi Song, a uh, PhD candidate, candidate that is at Beijing University, uh, who uh, will be discussing the historical records of the Wang family uh, and the, uh, you know, basically the political scene in Hong Kong uh, at the time and uh, family film companies in the U.S. and in China. I, uh, your host and MC, am Professor Cordelia Saporin of Fairleigh Dickinson University. Uh, I am the person who figured out the lost plot of this film uh, with the combination of reviewing the, uh, you know, completely intertitle lists raw surviving footage uh, and a little bit of, uh, well, a, a huge bit of good luck. And I will be discussing the process through which I decoded the uh, approximate meaning of the intertitles and what what is believed, what, what we believe people in the film are saying based on the gestural language of silent film that is locked into the picture of the surviving footage. So that is the program for today in that order, and we will begin now with Gregory Mark. Thank you, Cordelia. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, thank uh, the panelists uh, for uh, help for us putting together this panel and Cordelia for uh, working on the inner titles. Uh, I've seen the film starting in 1973 and I've probably seen it about 50 times, uh, yet I learned more uh, when the inner titles were put in and uh, was, I really appreciate having kind of a multi-discipline, multi-perspective at looking uh, at this wonderful film. And I think we all know that uh, it's a pioneering film. It's uh, not only in terms of silent movies, but in terms of uh, Asian American history uh, it is the first known Asian American film. And uh, it might be uh, ahead of actually uh, Asia too as well. And uh, when I gave a talk in Hong Kong a few years ago, uh, the key person in Hong Kong, Mr. Law, uh, told me that uh, Hong Kong uh, and Singapore did not have anything that was comparable to this at that time period and before that. So um, let's start with uh, looking at the family tree. And uh, Ben, can you put on the family tree, please? Thank you. So uh, this is the... Uh, at the top right is uh, Chin Si and Jim Sing Wong. And these are Marion Wong's parents. Uh, Jim Sing was born in China uh, in 1844 and came out approximately 1864 and was one of the 20,000 uh, Chinese laborers who worked on the Transcontinental Railroad. And Chin Si uh, was born in the United States, in fact, in San Francisco Chinatown. And uh, they were married uh, uh, when she was still quite a young person and Chim's, Jim Singh was uh, middle age. And uh, as a result, they had seven children of which uh, we have four on this family tree. And so of course, on Below on the right side is Marion Wong. Marion's uh, the youngest 
of uh, Chin Si's children. And um, the oldest on the other side is Alice Lim Bin. Uh, next is Rose Atai and Albert Wong, who's my grandfather. And Albert's wife is Violet Wong, uh, the next person who uh, is the star of the film. And um, both Marion and Violet were born in 1895. And um, they first met in 1911 in Hong Kong, where um, uh, Marion and Albert were taken by their parents, Chin Si and Jim Singh, uh, to Hong Kong primarily with little side trips into China and primarily for them to get married. And um, Marion was supposed to marry a Hong Kong banker and she said, no, I want to marry for love. Uh, Albert uh, had an arranged marriage, met Violet. Uh, Violet says that uh, she was sitting down and she was knitting and she saw uh, Albert's feet. And of course, Albert saw her and was dazzled with her beauty. And they ended up getting married uh, in 1911 during the time period of the Chinese Revolution, uh, which uh, we celebrate 1010, October 10, 1911, as the founding of the People's Republic of China, as well as the Republic of China. And uh, later on in 1912, they all came back uh, to the United States. Uh, although um, Chin Si, Albert, Rose, Alice, and Marion were US citizens, uh, they were still treated, uh, using the term then, is as um, aliens. And uh, so therefore, uh, even though they were citizens, they had to go through the interrogation at Angel Island uh, in San Francisco Bay as if they were not US citizens with that assumption by reason of race and ethnicity uh, that we were not Americans. And uh, so Violet uh, had this uh, wonderful experience of meeting Albert and coming over and starting a new life in 1912. And uh, below uh, is Albert and Violet's children. And you have Stella Wong Lee. Uh, Stella was a child, a baby during the filming. And um, she is in, in the parts that you will see next time you take a look at the film. The second child is Clara Wong Mark, and my mother, and there's my father, and so therefore there I am below them. Then my um, Aunt Gayla Wong Davis, then Marcella Wong Yasuhiro, Neilan Wong Gittleson, and Albert Wong Jr. And so um, the way this worked out, uh, to make the long story short, uh, Stella was able to get a hold of uh, Marion's copy of the film because each branch of the family that worked on the film, not all seven children did, uh, by via donating money, Alice and Rose uh, contributed time also in terms of uh, hairstyling, makeup, the costumes, uh, they sold it, it wasn't purchased. Uh, so they played a key role. Alice's uh, husband, um, Lim Bin, was uh, an Oakland Chinatown merchant. And of all the family units, uh, probably their family, uh, Lim Bin and Alice, were the primary donors uh, for the making of the film. And uh, then, in 1968, uh, Violet asked me to, uh, as a, a young man and her grandson, uh, took me down to the basement of the family house. And I remember it being really dark and danky in, in the basement, pointed to the corner on the left side. And there was an old canister of film. And uh, in it was three reels of 35 millimeter film. I took it up to a place called Palmer's uh, 
in uh, downtown Berkeley. And uh, upon orders of my grandmother uh, to do something with this, and I had it uh, transferred from 35 to 16 millimeter, uh, primarily to preserve the film and also allowing us as a family to view the film. And um, so later on, then uh, when Violet had possession, uh, she passed away in 1981. Uh, then I had the 16 millimeter copy. Then I gave it to my uh, Aunt Stella and um, she had it uh, in her uh, house as well as a photo collection uh, by Kim Lee, her husband, who was the San Francisco Chinatown primary photographer for 40 years. And um, in 1991, the Berkeley Asian American Studies Library purchased the Kim Lee collection, but also in the room was the 60 millimeter copy. Uh, and uh, they allowed me to take back whatever was accidentally in, taken by UC Berkeley. And I, I saw the canister. Uh, I recognize, of course, my own handwriting, uh, the 16 millimeter film and uh, took that back. And uh, then it went to my aunts who eventually donated it. And I think the year was uh, 2003, 2004 to the Motion Picture Academy. But at the same time, my aunt Stella was a Chinese American historian. She was a writer. She was a poet and just a wonderful artist. And, uh, but she also was a hoarder. And so uh, she was able to get a hold of Marion's copy because after Marion passed away in 1969, her copy, the 35 millimeter, went to her son, Henry. And so from Henry, he gave it to Stella, and then it ended up too at the Berkeley Asian American Studies Library. And they saw that it was dangerous, and so they uh, wanted to remove it. Ultimately, other family members arranged for it to be uh, driven down to LA to the Motion Picture Academy. And what we have today is a digitized version combining the 16 millimeter with the 35 millimeter, both belong to Violet and to Marion. And so we have missing copies out there that most likely Alice and Rose, at least, uh, their, uh, their family homes had copies. Of, we don't know what happened to it. And their descendants have looked for it, but uh, have not been a able to find it. And that's in a uh, short run what happened in terms of the pathway of the film. And uh, Marion and Alice, uh, it was interesting in terms of the looking at uh, the theme of the film. And you had Violet, uh, the primary uh, character in the film, the heroine, she um, plays an American born Chinese or what we slang term ABC, American born Chinese. And um, yet she had just immigrated in 1912 and they started filming in 1915. And, uh, but the bulk of everything was done in 1916. And Marion, who was American born, uh, born in 1895, also in San Francisco, she um, decided on, I'm going to take on this project. And uh, I think she was inspired by working at the family restaurant that was in downtown Oakland in the theater district. And also it was combined to be part of uh, one of the early Oakland Chinese Chinatowns in Oakland. and. Um, and working at Evans Cafe. Uh, and uh, I think she became inspired by members of Charlie Chaplin's crew and Charlie Chaplin. In my research, I found uh, Chaplin was filming in Niles Valley at that time period of 1915. 
And uh, so I think she was inspired by it. And I think they cooperated and supported her. So even though we call this an Asian American film from top to bottom in terms of um, Marion's project, directing, uh, producing, all the actors, uh, yet uh, there was uh, a European American uh, support uh, via Charlie Chaplin's crew and also family friends. Uh, so backtracking, and I know this is a bit convoluted, Jim Singh, after working on the railroad, went to Red Bluff, California and worked for a, a timber uh, company. And uh, he was the China boss man or the supervisor for 400 Chinese workers in Red Bluff. And so uh, similar to the model of the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. So he took care of and facilitated the hiring, the firing, the payroll, and so on, and the housing. And so um, he made a friend uh, uh, with a uh, this family called the Grotner family. And the Grotner family then uh, played a role in our family for a solid 60 years, uh, probably closer to 80 years. And um, I remember as a child going to San Francisco for large parties. And it was very unusual. And it was one of the old Victorian mansions in San Francisco in uh, the very exclusive area then and still today. And uh, uh, one of the descendants, uh, Mrs. Grotner, uh, would invite us over. And they had um, uh, really influenced Marion too as well. And so you had um, um, Marion's children, uh, some of their names besides Henry, was Arabelle, Annabelle. And so Belle, I don't know of any other Chinese American families that named their children, Arabelle, Annabelle, and so on. But that was part of the European American influence. And the Grotner family helped uh, to facil facilitate in 1912, violets coming over and being able to bypass Angel Island. So there was a collaboration, a lifelong collaboration of Jim Singh's friendship with the Grotner family and his descendants. And it, it went on for you know, many decades. And so um, in terms of uh, the exciting times of 1911, can you imagine uh, the four of them, Marion, Albert, Kinsey, and Jim Singh going to Hong Kong and October 10, 10, 10, 1911 was the Chinese Revolution. Dr. Sun Yat-sen uh, was Cantonese and was uh, born in an area in the district that Hong Kong falls under. And, uh, and so the principles of the founding of, of the Republic of China, uh, I'm sure influenced Marion at that time period and was part of the underlying theme of uh, curse of Guanggo. And uh, so that's something for us to explore at another time. And Cordelia has done a great job uh, in terms of really kind of uh, clarifying uh, what was going on in the film. I, I think uh, another thing and a major contribution uh, of the film is that Marion was way, way ahead of her time. 1916. And it wasn't until the end of the 20th century that we began to have Asian Americans, in particular Chinese Americans, uh, playing roles as everyday people. And uh, so she was influenced by, um, by all these factors. And uh, so as, and I thought besides uh, you know, her being a Chinese American woman, and there were not that many Chinese Americans, 63,000 in 1920 census, uh, that um, the marketing of the film, they, Chinsey and Marion went to New York in 1917. It was considered a failure, 
but they ran into uh, the end of World War I, and they ran into, as we know, the pandemic, the Spanish flu, of the ending, and we know that all too well since we're going through it today. And so, um, but one of the other things that was remarkable besides kind of uh, the size of the Chinese American community and Marion made this film as a featured film, not for a Chinese American audience. The intention was to go beyond, but the American public and the international public just wasn't ready for it at that time period and the conditions weren't right. But the fact is that you had Asian Americans playing Asian Americans. And later on, we saw people uh, using yellow face of uh, pretending like the good earth. Uh, you took uh, essentially white actors uh, and uh, gave them makeup, slanted their eyes. And for uh, decades, that was much of the portrayal. And one of the more famous ones was Boris Karloff. And um, so th the film was ahead of its time because of uh, uh, the more accurate portrayal uh, did not use stereotypes like later films of Chinese men in particular, of the um, opium dens, of the Tong Wars, and so uh, this went on. So uh, that was one of the major influences at that time period. So we could uh, take down the family tree now, Ben. The other thing that I thought was important was the um, looking at not just the family, but the Chinese community in particular in Oakland, because it was shot primarily in Oakland in the backyard of my great grandparents house. And uh, so parts of it also were shot on location in the hills above Hayward, San Leandro, California. Uh, where Niles Valley was, uh, which preceded Hollywood, but also I think some of the scenes were shot uh, at Niles Valley as well. And so, uh, but the community played a role. So it wasn't just the Wong family, uh, it was friends, it was supporters uh, throughout the Chinese community, primarily in Oakland. Now, um, Marion and Violet became lifelong friends. And I remember uh, family gatherings uh, at Violet's dining room, our family restaurant, of everyone coming over. And we had uh, photographs of, you know, 100 plus people at the restaurant celebrating uh, th events like Thanksgiving. And, um, and Marion and Kim Hong, her husband, and at times her children, because I was born much later, uh, would come to these events. And uh, so they made sure that their immediate family, uh, the brothers and sisters would get together and play mahjong, uh, but also we would have the larger extended family gatherings. But they held a very unique uh, relationship. After the filming, uh, there's a f uh, some photographs of Marion and Violet dancing in costume. And what they did is uh, they did take advantage of some of the stereotypes in the sense that um, uh, exotic, gla glamorous um, Chinese women. And so um, there was in downtown Oakland, there was hotels like the Lexington Hotel. And during tea time and other times they would dance. And this is how they supplemented their incomes uh, because we were not a rich family. And uh, so they received tip money and, um, and money from the hotel to be performers and said so they did this. Marion later on opened up her own restaurant. Uh, before we had um, karaoke, uh, she had cabaret there and she was known for singing Italian opera songs uh, at her restaurant. And so uh, food was very much a part of the culture of our family. Evans Cafe in downtown Oakland, Violet's Dining Room, uh, Marion's Restaurant in Richmond, California. And so uh, this went on for years. But 
what was key was, I thought, in the making of this film was the trust and the friendship and loyalty to each other uh, of Marion and Violet. And uh, again, we grew with that. And I think the last main comment that I'd like to make is um, in terms of this being a pioneering film is the, and it wasn't subtle, but, uh, but very much uh, Violet trying to acculturate to Chinese village society in terms of having uh, the jam cha, the, uh, serving tea, the wedding ceremony uh, in China, uh, in the village. And uh, so the issue that's still an issue today in the Chinese American community, Asian American community, and uh, that Marion raised over 100 years ago was of ethnic identity. And so uh, very much uh, Violet's identity as a Chinese, as a Chinese American, and the rest of the characters. Uh, even Harvey, uh, who plays the husband, you see him uh, wearing very much uh, cutting edge Western clothing in the beginning. And uh, later on, kind of more costume with the hat, uh, the Chinese clothes. And so again, it's this, uh, who are we? Are we marginalized? Where do we fit in as Chinese Americans? And Marion raised that issue to today. And, um, and when we look at the Asian American movement and we look at Asian hate that's been going on today, uh, very much a part of the backdrop and that's happening today is the strength of the Asian American community, in particular the Chinese American community, the resilience and the whole issue of who we are in American society, that we are Americans. We are Chinese Americans, we are Asian Americans. And, um, and this is part of the education process and Marion started in 1916. Uh, so thank you very much for listening to me and uh, hopefully we'll have a rich interaction later on with some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. That was awesome. Really appreciate it. All right, next up we have Yanfi Song. Uh, are you prepared to go on, Yanfi? Yes. <laughs> All right, break a leg. We'll see you in a bit. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Yan Fei Song. Um, I'd like to express my gratitude to Cordelia, who re-edited, who added the intertitle of the new intertitle of the course of Quan Guang. And I, as a Chinese language speaker, learned a lot from this intertitle. And I also want to thank Professor Gins. As I remember, um, the, the, it was Professor Gins who helped us to contact the academy to get the, uh, the, cl the uh, clear version, a more uh, better image of uh, the curse of Quan Guang. And I'd like to thank her for doing Im invite me to the presentation. And today I'm going to talk about Marilyn Wong as a Chinese American woman film pioneer. Marion Evelyn Wong, AKA uh, Wang Nuihe was born on January 12th, 1895 in San Francisco and passed away on February 4th, 1969 in Oakland, California. She was the third generation of Chinese American on her mother's side. 
uh, Marian's father's name is, yeah, uh, as Greg has told us, Jim Xin Wang. He was born in Guangdong in, nine, in 1844. In his twenties, Jim moved to San Francisco as a railway walker. In December, 1885, he married American-born Chinese Ching Si and gave birth to seven children. And Marion was the youngest child. In 1916, Marilyn Wong started the Mandarin Film Company in Oakland. In the same year, she made The Curse of Quan Guang. She was the, the director, the producer, screenwriter of this film. This film tells a story of a young westernized Chinese couple and their difficulties with their more traditional family. It was six years earlier than James B. Long's Lotus Blossom, and nine years earlier than Xie Caijin's An Orphan's Cry, AKA Gu Chu Bei Sheng. And Xie is considered as the first woman director in mainland China. Wang's attempt to make films for those who want to see what authentic Chinese customs are, made her a Chinese American film pioneer. In 1911, Marilyn Wong was 16 years old and her brother Albert was 12, oh, 20, sorry. They were old enough to have marriages. However, the sex racial imbalance was huge among Chinese immigrants in the, in the United States. According to the United States 1910 census, that there were 71,531 Chinese, of whom only 6.5% of them were women. So it was very hard for men to find their mates. In order to find mates for their children, Marilyn Wong's parents planned a trip to Hong Kong on August 22nd, 1911. In Hong Kong, Marion had a blind date with a banker who, works, who worked in Hong Kong, while Albert met with Violet Zhang Wong, later his wife, and the leading actress of the curse in the curse of Quan Guang. As we all know, the year 1911 was a decisive year for Chinese. It was the year that the 1911 revolution occurred, which brought an end to emperor re regime and also represented the birth of Asia's first republic. This revolution occurred on October 10th, 1911 and ended on February 12th, 1912 with the end of the Qing dynasty. As a witness of the 1911 revolution, Mary Wong and her family had a once in the lifetime opportunity to experience the mingle of tradition and modern, the East and the West, the feudal system and republic of voice, and conservative and revolutionary, which was pretty much the, the theme, the theme of the Kershaw Quan Guang. During the, their stay in Hong Kong, the Wangs traveled to Kaiping. Kaiping is a county in Guangdong province where Marion's father was born. According to Marion's family, they stayed in Kaiping for one week, but we haven't found out who they met with and what happened when they were in the hometown. Although the ones were the third generation American 
Americans. The Gary Act mandated the carry ID cards and strictly limited the travel and legal rights of all US residents of Chinese descent. Mary Wong and her brother had only one year to find mates or the Gary Act would have blocked their return to the US. So they must go back to San Francisco in one year or never. Finally, they returned to San Francisco on July 15th, 1912 by a vessel named Korea. During the, their trip to Hong Kong in 1911, brother Albert Wong and Violet Wong got married on October 25th, 1911 in Hong Kong. As for Marion, she refused to marry the banker with the support of her mother. Aiding people and cult culture are important conversations in American screen since the born of cinema. People in um, America tried to understand Asia from moving images. As early as 1970, as early as 19, 1897, Photographers in the interests of Edison Company traveled to Hong Kong, Macau, Guangzhou, and Shanghai to record the first Edison produced films of the Asian Pacific. At that time, of all the reels about China and Chinese people, most of them were documentaries. However, there were various negative types of Chinese people, custom and habits in American films. Chinese were described as ignorant, uneducated, unlightened, addict, and Chinese customs are superstitious and mysterious. And including the, the makeup in film, there were many, there were all kinds of stereotypes um, or negative, let's say negative types in the makeup guide for um, those professional or amateur who make up for characters who play Chinese. And two cases in point are The Red Letter and The Firstborn. These two films were released in early 1920s in New York and triggered the anger of overseas Chinese. They believed that these films presented a negative image of China especially the presentation of Chinese women's foot binding. They even negotiated with the authority in New York. Some matter had been taken up with while they, they also were told that if the Chinese were able to produce films on their own and to explain how beautiful Eastern culture is, then these terrible films would certainly disappear. So under this background, the Great Wall Film Company and the Peacock Motion Pictures Cooperation was founded in reaction against the humiliation. Melanie Wong said was, was report Mary Wong said in the local newspaper that, quote, I had never seen any Chinese movies. So I decided 
to introduce them to the world. I first wrote the love story. Then I decided that people who are interest, interested in my people and my country would love to see some of, of the customs and matters, manners of China. So I added the love story. So I added to the love story drama many scenes depicting these things. I do hope it'll be a success. The, re the reason why we think Marion's Mandarin Film Company was a family business is to, due to several factors. First, this film was mainly was, was shot in their backyard and and the their the backyard would be their shooting site um, and second most of the cast was comprised of Wang's relatives for example Marion's mother Ching Si act as the mother-in-law her sister-in-law and dear friend Violet Wong was the leading actress. Violet and Albert's first child, Stella, was the baby girl, and Marion herself acted as the villainess. Third, Marion got the financial support mainly from family, and Ben Lin invested, was the major investor and also Albert Wong, her brother, also invested in the company. But what is worthy of noting is that in some research that Ben Lin was Marion's maternal uncle, but that's not true. Ben Lin was Marion's brother-in-law and the husband of Alice Lin. Alice was the eldest sister of Marion's. Also, the costume, hairstyling, makeup, and settings are there under the help of her family. There were also family-owned film business in mainland China. For example, the, Shang, the Shanghai Film Company. This company was founded by Dan Du Yu in 1921. Dan Du Yu was the, the director, producer, photographer, screenwriter, and editor of most of uh, the film that Shanghai Film Company produced. And she, uh, he was the K role in this film, family owned film company. And Yi Ming Zhu, a very famous actress back then in 1920s was, um, was his, his wife and Dan Archun, um, he was the, um, the grandson, he was Dan Du Yu's nephew's grandson, and also an actor, and the first child actor in Chinese film history. And this is their shooting site in, in Shanghai. There were two very famous uh, films. One is Swear by God, AKA Hai Shi. It was produced in 1922. It was the earliest full length film in China, also a love story. And another one is Cave of Silken Web. Um, so this, this film had be very beautiful settings and 
the half naked woman made this this film the bestseller in 1927 as a costume film. So here I I want to say that the Shanghai Film Company is all uh, the, the Shanghai Film Company and Marion's um, Mandarin Film Company are are um, the comp these companies is um, so Mary Wong and Dan Du Yu played a key played key roles in their film companies and also their families helped in the, the making, producing, the distributing uh, the film. In July, in July 1917, Mary Wong made a trip to New York City with her mother. They were trying to find distributors for the curse of Guang Guang. But despite these efforts, there were little commercial interest in the film. Marini Wong got married with Kim Hong on May 23rd, 1917. And she changed her name to Marini Hong. Mary Wong met with Kim Hong in the University of California, where she studied in the university and took up special work. And Hong was the first Chinese American who graduated from University of California. And together they have five children. I think um, the fate of the curse of Quang Guang is, so the curse of Quang Guang had never been officially distributed. I think there are some factors and the main factors would be first, the anti-Chinese movement. Um, I think uh, the, the Page Act of 1875 prohibited the, in, in the entry of Chinese women and Chinese Exclusion Act of, 20, of 1882 prohibiting all immigrants of Chinese labors and Gary Act of 1892 extended the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 by adding new requirements. And also the company was film, was family, was a family studio with non-professional stuff. Um, so in, in this case, the cast, or the stuff, including the, the leading actor, actress, um, and people who do costume, hairstyle, are not professional. So that's maybe one reason for them, for, for the curse of Kuang Guang. It's, the, the sadly ending of Curse of Quan Guang. And also um, may probably um, 1918 influenza pandemic also affect, affected the distribution of the Curse of Quan Guang. And third, uh, Fourth, I think um, the limited market is was probably a big problem 
the curse of Quan Guang was far ahead of Mary Wong's time with no regular audience. And as Mary have said, uh, has said, um, she was trying to make films for those who were interested in her country and her people, but who are they? Are they Chinese audience? Are they Chinese American? Or are they American audience? We will never know. And also the film's rep represent repre representation of Ameri Asian Americans is a sharp contrast to this negative typed Asian characters in mainstream films of the period. So there was a report that saying that Marilyn Wong refused to use the stereotypes that American films always adopted. And then it became the, the, the factor that uh, the distributors wouldn't like no one want to distribute, want to reduce, release her curse of Quan Guang. And I think those are major factors for the sad ending of the curse of Quan Guang. And that's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anfi. That was awesome. I really Thank do. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, the the first thing that I want to say to to transition uh, is that you know when it comes to the question of who the film was for, I think whoever Marion Wong may have intended the audience to be, we're who the film is for. Like she made a film so far ahead of its time that it's really for an audience for, from a more enlightened future. So she made a film for us and thank gosh we have it. <laughs> I, I also wanted to, uh, obviously, um, before I go into my spiel uh, and tell you about the restoration, uh, my part of it, I wanted to also thank uh, our other panelists, especially Greg and uh, Yanfi because uh, while I did, you know, figure out like the, the, the basic plot points, uh, you know, Gregory Mark is the person who had the family memory to confirm and explain a lot of big question marks that we had. Yanfi was crucial uh, in giving us, uh, you know, the, the Chinese translations. She was running back and forth and talking to everyone who she knew who was a Cantonese speaker and, you know, giving me uh, notes on, on uh, like what the characters' names uh, could be and also, you know, uh, correcting. That uh, was tough. <laughs> <laughs> I, yes, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that apparently there's no standardized like romanization like English spelling of Cantonese words so I'm sorry that was asking way more of you than I realized I apologize Yanfi. No it's okay. <laughs> and, and I also made friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> Making friends through through having to, to translate uh, silent films right uh, but but also uh, you know for we're just being like the, the, the overall cultural go-betweens, you know, I think Yanfi was crucial at being the, the Chinese cultural, uh, you know, liaison and Greg, the Chinese American cultural liaison. So we, uh, you know, I, I really am indebted very, very much to both of you. Uh, I also wanted to, to, to say that um, uh, Greg also uh, really is, I, I think the person who got the Academy to uh, grant us permission to use their uh, high resolution print. Um, I was there at like the meetings where they, they basically said that the whole reason why they have it at all is because of Greg's family giving it to them. So uh, we're, we're very, very lucky. Uh, speaking of which, I meant to say this before, but I forgot. Uh, after this panel concludes, I will be 
uh, dropping a link to the video on YouTube. It is an unlisted link, so you can't search for it uh, into the chat. So everyone who missed it yesterday uh, will be able to see it. It will only be live for a limited amount of time. We will be taking it down uh, at the end of this conference uh, which I believe is tomorrow, uh, basically because we only have the, the, the Academy's permission to use it for this event right now. Uh, we are hoping to get their permission to use it again for in-person premieres of the full film and you know maybe, maybe other things down the road, but uh, so watch it as soon as possible before we take it down. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess that leaves us uh, to go to my panel now. Um, so let me just... Uh, prepare that. Okay, so I actually I'm not going to share anything just yet. Uh, I, I also, you know, while I'm thanking people, I wanted to, of course, thank the Women Film Pioneers Project and Jane Gaines uh, for, you know, being the the scholarly consensus that I, you know, posited my findings to who, you know, as a group, uh, pretty much confirmed that they thought I was right in my interpretation. And that's a very important thing. Like, you know, I, I, I thought I was right too, but it was good to have people agree with me. And that's really, I think, a, a big part of what propelled this whole project forward. Um, so uh, basically, to begin, uh, I am going to uh, first describe what the existing footage was, what I saw. So uh, if any of you have the uh, Pioneers First Women Filmmakers DVD box set, that is where I saw the surviving footage for the first time of this film. And uh, it, if you have seen it without the intertitles, there's also, I think, low resolution, barely watchable versions of it online on YouTube. Um, they, it, it, the film, watches like an avant-garde film. Like I describe it as, you know, it looks like Chinese people walking in and out of doors. You can tell there's supposed to be a plot, but it's not clear what that plot is. And as a result, uh, the, the footage of the film, you know, prior to this restoration is a little frustrating to watch uh, because you can tell it's not supposed to be that way. It's not an avant-garde film. It's a narrative film with a plot. So watching it without understanding it is a little frustrating. It is, it, it, it's, it's annoying because you want to know, <laughs> you want to know the message that you're supposed to be hearing. So um, basically the story is uh, my husband and I watched the raw footage or the, the, the surviving footage uh, on the Blu-ray that is actually like behind me over there. Uh, and uh, I was hoping, you know, because I have this background in being like, you know, a, a, a big, you know, silent film buff and scholar, uh, I, I was hoping to be able to understand it. So we watched it. And as the credits rolled, uh, my husband goes, well, that was baffling. And I was like, yeah, I had no idea what any of it meant. I had the same experience as everyone else. Like, dang, like it would be so interesting to know what this film was. And that night, you know, I, I went to bed and I was tossing and turning and like, you know, being bothered by not understanding the film. And just as I was drifting off for no clear reason, I popped awake, like, wait a minute. <laughs> and I shook my husband awake. This is the plot of the film. And he was like, oh my God. And so uh, it, it came to me out of nowhere. So I like to give credit to the ghost of Marion Wong uh, for, for all we know, she is the one who, who just spontaneously gave it to me. Basically, there were a few core moments, uh, you know, the big, you know, dramatic moments when whenever a story has, you know, some some big emotion in it, those are the moments to start with where like, you know, how, like, what, what is causing this? Like, what is this big scene? You know, what is the, the motivation behind it? And uh, basically, unlocking a few key moments and then going back and watching the film over and over and over again, slow motion, frame by frame, uh, I was able to, you know, basically uh, flesh out everything else and, you know, put everything in context and make it make sense. So um, one of the there's, there's basically a, a combination of skills that were necessary to, to put the whole puzzle together. Uh, and it, then it took some time, but uh, 
Part of it, of course, was having a strong familiarity with silent films, particularly period silent films from the 1910s, you know, as a film professor and silent film being one of my, my fortes. Obviously, I've seen a ton of 1910s silent films, so that helped a lot. Um, also, uh, you know, a an awareness of a thing called the lexicon of gestures, which I'll be going over in uh, a moment, uh, which is basically a a silent film language, a, a pantomime gesture language through which silent film uh, actors expressed uh, emotions and and various other states of being. Um, so obviously another thing that helped tremendously was my training uh, as a professional filmic storyteller. My bachelor's degree from NYU Tisch is uh, in film and television production, specializing in animation. So, you know, learning the the gestures and, and ways of, of drawing and depicting, uh, you know, humanoid emotion through animation training and you know the story beats storytelling through the live action film training that I have it was I think very helpful to me to be able to sort of put myself in the shoes of the director and think like well like why would I tell someone to do this if I were making a film like like why would I as the director have them do what they do it's like well maybe if I was trying to express you know x so that's that's uh you know a big a big part of it but going back to what i mentioned before the lexicon of gestures um so in silent film you may notice that uh actors uh are usually using their whole bodies to emote and express uh everything. They they don't just act with their faces like people in modern movies. And there's a very important reason why. Uh, it has to do with the history of uh, acting styles from the period. Uh, basically, there is a tradition of acting that date ba dates back to the Victorian stage, where uh, because of the size of theaters, uh, and you know, if you had like a seat way in the back, if the acting was subtle, you couldn't see anything. So the actors on stage, you know, came up with this really, uh, you know, elaborate set of gestures to express modes of feeling that uh, would be readable from a great distance. And of course, because uh, film at the time was relatively new and it was informed by the acting styles that were popular of, of the times that came before it, therefore, we are seeing a lot of these same acting styles in films, you know, uh, like, you know, you even see vestiges of it as late as the 1930s, but like, you know, certainly in the 1910s, we are in the moment of really seeing, uh, you know, the, the lexicon of gestures in its full flourish. So, uh, Ben, if you could put up the first image from the lexicon of gestures, uh, this is an actual image that you'll be seeing um, in a moment, I hope. Oh dear, have I frozen? Uh oh. Uh oh. Well, if anyone can hear me, I apologize. This seems to be glitching out on my end. Uh, oh my goodness, this is this is bad. I apologize. What? It's on. All right. My husband shouted from below that that it is on, and only my end is getting the spinny ball of doom. So I will just. Uh, describe what I hope you are seeing. Um, <laughs> basically, this is a, a page from James Naramore's Acting in the Cinema. It is a reprint, a recreation of the uh, of, of one of the booklets that you would buy in the Victorian era if you were an actor or a director, and uh, you would study these attitudes uh, to express the feelings of, you know, whatever character you were portraying. Um, and so here we, I, I, I can't see it myself, but I assume that we are seeing the one that depicts the attitude of triumph and anguish. Uh, so those are, uh, you know, examples of the sorts of attitudes that you would see uh, coming to you from the Victorian stage um, that would also be later used in silent film. Uh, then next up, uh, if we could see the 
next slide in the lexicon of, of gestures. I'll just pretend that I can see it. Um, uh, so hopefully in, in this one, you will be able to see a, uh, a more cartoonish figure uh, who is, you know, depicting, uh, you know, a, a pose that inclines forward and one that inclines back. Now, when we say phrases like, we are inclined to do something, we are disinclined to do something, this actually has roots in human psychology. Uh, like my animation professor, John Canemaker, used to say, we move because we think. And this is very much uh, you know, what you are seeing here. You, you're seeing uh, motion that is derived from thought. And that is how, if you read motions, and if you read them correctly and study them carefully enough, you can recreate what is probable, uh, what, 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 their, what their thoughts were probably about or probably going to be. Um, now, finally, the uh, last and final uh, image from the lexicon of gestures that I have, uh, if, if, if you'll put it up, I of course can't see anything. My video was totally frozen for me, but uh, this is facial expressions. Uh, this, you know, is a dead giveaway. You don't actually need to be an expert to read these, obviously. So basically uh, putting all these elements together is how I came uh, to, you know, really study the film, study the blocking, the motions, the expressions, and the pantomime. Uh, and if, uh, if this is working, uh, then I will show you a little bit of how I did that. So Ben, if you could stop sharing, let's see if my Zoom will uh, come back to normal. And if not, I'm thinking I might have to sign out and start this video again, because if it's not working and the next thing that I have to do is to share my screen, uh, I, I won't be able to do that. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Greg and or Yanfi and or Jane to cover for me as I leave this meeting and come back and hope that it works a little bit better the next time. My apologies, I'll be right back. I, th I think we should take up this fascinating question in the chat about reading the Cantonese language and Yanfi, <laughs> Yeah, I had two questions about this because number one, these are amateurs and how can we connect amateurs with professional acting lexicons? That's probably a question for Cordelia, but my question for you and Greg is about, are they speaking? We know as historians of silent cinema that Lillian Gish describes how there would always be someone on the set taking down for the intertitles what the actors were saying to each other when they improvised because there was often no script. So let, let's deal with this question. Would they be even speaking? Would Violet clearly be learning English because yeah. she's a native Cantonese speaker? Can't, you want to weigh in on this before we get to Cordelia? Yeah. I. I... <laughs> This actually what is a good question, and um, I honestly speaking, I thought about that, <laughs> and I tried to um, figure out what Violet was speaking, and I can't, I can't. First, I'm not a Cantonese speaker, and second, is um, I think it's the the quality of the image that it probably is me, but I can't tell. I can't tell the, the lip, uh, the movement of the lip to tell. Um, also, there are so but, few close-ups. Yeah. Well, let me interject since this was my grandmother. Yes. So she, yeah, please. <clears throat> she had only been in the United States for three years and she was primarily a Cantonese speaker. In fact, a different dialect than Albert's family. Uh, and, but she spoke, but she did learn to speak a little English and Cordelia thinks, and I think so too, that she did speak some English. And I think she probably knew more English than her mother-in-law uh, who was born in San Francisco. Oh. Also, I had Cantonese lip readers look at this when I gave a few talks in Hong Kong. And that's the time when I determined 
uh, that Marion was the first wife. We weren't sure if she was a sister or first wife. And there were indications by hairstyle and so on, uh, but it was confirmed when I was in Hong Kong by the lip readers. So, so your, your friends in Hong Kong told you that Marion uh, was playing the, the first wife in the film. Right, they weren't my friends, they were professional lip readers. Which, I mean, that's, I, I actually didn't even know that. That's, that's amazing. Like we, yeah. I, yeah. I think <laughs> now that we have a, a clearer idea about what the plot of the film is, I would like, I would love to get Cantonese uh, speaking lip readers to take another look at this film. Cause I think, I, I think it's high time for that. Uh, you know, e even, even if they somehow like decide against me and say, no, you're, you're wrong. Like, I don't care. I want this to be accurate. Um, but the, uh, so, so here's, here's my, my take on it. And, and, and originally, uh, Greg and I, uh, like, like he had told me that like the, the actors, you know, are all speaking Cantonese, but, um, you know, I, I've seen so many silent films that like most people, most audience members from the silent era, I can read lips but only in English. Uh, so I, the only part of the film I could read was Violet Wong's lines. You can see very clearly, especially in her close up. Oh no, oh please, my baby, she says, like you could, like she, she obviously says real English words in that shot in that one dramatic close up where she's irised in, it's like the, no question. Also, when Marion Wong's villainess tries to take her baby away, you clearly see, see her going, nope, like you can even like almost hear it. Nope, you know, she like pushes her away. Um, every other actor, I had no idea what they were saying. And I think that this is, you know, like, like in all silent films, when you shot any silent film back in the day, the only professional way to do it was to have the actors always speak in character. And that meant if they spoke a certain language and their character was supposed to speak that language, that was the language that they would use. So ironically, we have this thing where Violet, though she is, I think the only person in the film who is a Chinese born Chinese person, uh, she is the only person playing an American born Chinese person. So she is the only person who is speaking English. Uh, everybody else around her seems to be speaking Cantonese. And uh, you know, the, the, the fact that I can read her alone, I think confirms that. Um, I, I also, yes, that, that's, that's something else that I should really mention that uh, my original interpretation, because I've done several passes of this film, when I first saw it, I was confused about Marion Wong's villainous status. I, I originally misinterpreted her. Yeah, we had, we had a discussion. Yeah, yeah, Yanvi was right. I was wrong. She is actually- the Oh, because I wrote, I, I wrote some um, reports in Chinese. It's in Chinese media, on Chinese media. Uh. Oh, it looks like we have somebody who just said, I'm a Cantonese speaker and film scholar. I can try to assist if you like, please contact me. Well, we will, thank you. Uh, so, so basically, yeah. Um, so when I first saw it, I, I misinterpreted Marion Wong's evil character as like, uh, like a villainous spinster aunt, you know, something that you might see in an American silent film. And Yanfi was actually the first person to uh, to say, well, I think she looks more like a first wife in a polygamous situation. And I was resistant to that, I, I confess, because we knew Marion Wong was an American, you know, she was, she was a Chinese American. She like was familiar with obviously with the, the silent film vernacular of her time, familiar with the kind of plots that would have been acceptable and popular. And we also know that she likely, in, like she, she clearly intended her film for mainstream mass distribution. So then there's this question, how would you put like a polygamous marriage in this film? Like you should know, I mean, especially if you're, if you're a Chinese American person, if you're an American at all from 1916, you should know that that would be considered unacceptable by the censors. However, interestingly, uh, you know, I, I was wrong. Greg confirmed Yan Fee's uh, speculation, which was 
completely on the, on, on the nose. You were right, Anfi. I apologize for, for being wrong. Um, but, but that's, uh, and, and at first I really struggled with that because I was like, well, like, but like polygamy, like, like you know, ah, like, like so, so, so inappropriate. But then the more I thought about it, the more I realized that, like, I think I said yesterday, this is just, this is just yet another way that this film is way ahead of its time. This is like a master stroke of cultural relativism. Marion Wong just expects you to be cool enough to accept that, well, these are consenting adults. They have agreed to be in this polygamous marriage together. What's your problem? And I kind of belatedly realized like, you know, this, this film, not only was it ahead of its time in, you know, the 1910s, it's ahead of its time in the 2020s. And that's insane. So that's what we're dealing with here. Thank you guys for uh, 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 covering for me. I'm I'm ready to screen share unless anybody else wanted to say anything else before I go to it. One one last comment, and that is uh, along this line, is that Chin Si made the most clear Cantonese speaking line, and that was go, which you pointed right. Yes, yes, that was a major contribution of Greg. Like this is this is the kind of thing that that I'm talking about. Where like I I got like you know like the the nuts and bolts of the plot basically, and the nuts and bolts of the the lines. But you know having Greg like like I I think that was like the first line that you like gave me. Is, oh, she's definitely saying just go because I, I I originally had that as like be gone from this house, and he was like no 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 that's just go. And, and oh, you know, means go, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, I, my hope, my hope is, you know, because this, this, what we have now uh, is like, obviously, you know, it's only the first 25 minutes, like it is, it is the, the addition that we have now, but we are constantly digging and hoping to uncover more information. Obviously, if we can get Cantonese lip readers to take another look at this film, maybe we can get things like accurate character names. That would be amazing. If we can even get more specific translations of the dialogue, I would be willing to adjust the, you know, the language of the uh, intertitles to better reflect that. Like that's, the goal here is authenticity and for always, uh, you know. So Cordelia, I, I have a question here because I'm still not satisfied with this dilemma of the uh, po polygamy. And, and, and thank you, Denise Mock, for volunteering to help with um, more interpretation. But here's the dilemma. I would have thought that this would be tradition. And here's where Yanfi and Gregory would explain that it's a Chinese tradition. And we're talking about a cultural clash at that time, not necessarily something progressive. I, I, I was assuming, and I'm just speaking for an audience learning, how did Yanfi and Gregory determine that the character, the Marion Wong character is a first wife. Would that have to do with, is this a merchant family where there's money? And why take both a Chinese American and a Chinese wife? Greg, you wanna? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> you have a number of questions in there. Um, <clears throat> Well, I'm gonna just, I'm not gonna answer the whole thing because I, I don't want, I want Cordelia to continue with hers, but I'll, I'll just respond. And I think Jim Singh kind of had to give a stamp of approval at certain points. Right. Remember in building the railroad, uh, a very key contingent in building the Western half of the transcontinental railroad were the Mormons and who practiced polygamy. And so, uh, so it wasn't something to hide and be embarrassed about from probably Jim Singh's perspective, because not only within Chinese culture, if he had enough money, right, uh, but also uh, from some of the Westerners that he had come in contact with, starting with the building of the railroad. But we, uh, I found out when we first did a showing in 2007 in Oakland, uh, we uh, several people in the audience said they think she's first wife. I wasn't sure because I had the same debate that everyone else had. But uh, I felt more confident when I went to Hong Kong, gave several talks at the Hong Kong Film Archive, and uh, 
met up with some people and um, the lip readers were brought in by the Hong Kong Film Archive to work with me and take a look. So that's where I felt strong enough to make that statement to Cordelia, first wife. I also think that, you know, as Yanfi, I think, told me at one point, it's it's sort of a sort of traditional that first wives in like, you know, very old stories are the villains because, you know, they they might be older and jealous of like the new wife. They might not be able to have children. We don't know why it is that he, you know, marries uh, Violet's character other than that they're clearly in love, you know. And again, this is a culture of arranged marriage where like maybe maybe he and Marion were just like never really great for each other, but they had to marry because they were, you know, status mates or something, you know, uh, that, that this is, you know, this is a, a traditional story. Unfortunately, we're missing the first, you know, reel or, or two of the film that explains what like like who each character is what their you know established situation is how boy meets girl and all of that so i i'm hoping that maybe greg some some relative of yours is going to come forward with reels uh in, in the future that will you know further elucidate this question but i i do believe that you know we're we're really looking at uh marion wong not judging chinese culture and I think that very much like the whole film is, you know, about portraying Chinese culture as normal and giving it normalcy. Right. And, and, and that really stands, you know, in contrast, like you were saying, Greg, to, oh, and, 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 and Yanfi too, like both of you were saying to the, you know, rather racist depictions that we see from the same time. Oh yes, we have looked for a, a script people. Yeah, <laughs> I wish we found a script, right? Um, but yeah. And I want to share why I made this uh, judgment because um, first I compared English research and Chinese research. And I found out that in Chinese uh, research, uh, scholars consider Marilyn Wong, the character she played, or is the first wife. And, um, and also I, I made this judgment on based on possibility. Let's see, let's, um, let's if we say that the, the um, Marilyn Wong's character is the sister or an aunt, it's not, there's, it's, it, it's, there's a possibility, but not that much because if you are a woman in old China, and you are old enough to have marriage, but you don't, then it's, it's a, not a good thing. <laughs> yeah, so, so there's a, a big spinster. possibility. <laughs> spinster, yeah. Spinster. And, and, yeah. and you might not be living with the family that yeah. has a male age, you know, like the, and and also I, I, I have to say, so, so, like I'm talking about with the 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 process of restoring the the intertitles has to do with really studying the acting, really you know watching it frame by frame to see like what the human interactions are, what the motivations are, what the the relationships between the characters, the emotion at any given time. And the thing is, my original version, even I was unsatisfied with the explanation that she was a spinster aunt or a sister or something. I was like, we're missing something here. Something is wrong. Yanfi said, I think that she's a first wife. And I was like, that makes much more sense than anything else. But I initially was resistant to it for the reasons that I mentioned. But then, you know, the more I thought about it, the more I was like, you know, Yanfi might be right. And that's why I asked Greg and, you know, there you have it. That's, that, that's what it is. It's, it's about, I think, portraying Chinese culture of the time for what it was without judgment and normalizing it and not, you know, shaming it. And yet portraying it authentically and for in all of its uniqueness and showing it as it was. And I think that that is clearly what's going on, you know, even if it uh, makes a So time. we need, Cornelia, we need to move to your exemplification. And then we've got this explosion of questions as I have not seen on any other panel this weekend. Oh, and good. we really need to wrap by taking them. So you you set up, are looking at something, right? 
yeah, so so uh, I, I guess like technically if I'm supposed to end at 4.30, maybe I have nine more minutes to- uh, Well, no, you yeah. and the questions have nine more minutes. Me and the questions. Well, yeah. Look, okay, so let me just give you the lightning round version then, okay? How about are, that? Are we going to view something? We are indeed going to Great. view the curse of Guangun. Let me screen share. This, whoops, that's not what I meant to screen share. This is what I meant to screen share. Okay, so uh, basically here we have, oh, is this visible to you? I don't want it there. It's uh, blank. What? It's blank. Blank? You, can. you can't see this. All right, well then let me try that again. Why don't we screen share finder? Is this going to work? Can you see this? Yes. Yes. Anyway. Okay, good. So, so here, I, I will take us to one of the core key scenes hmm, that, uh, that gave me the, the idea for, uh, you know, like, like how to, to decode something. All right. So here we see them get married, right? Then we see him say something to her and she cries, right? And then in a later scene, there's a baby like well there wasn't a baby before what do you think happened and so i'm thinking well why would someone who's about to have a baby cry why isn't the husband there when the baby is born put it together he's telling her i won't be here when your baby is born i'm going away on a trip she cries and is upset about that then we see her you know escorting him out on the trip so here is th then there's a jump in in footage in between that and the next scene, we are missing some reels. Thankfully, it's clear, you know, what we're missing because, you know, like I said, there's no baby. Suddenly there's a baby. What happened? Well, maybe someone had a baby. You know, uh, another thing is that um, uh, later on, not in the version that we saw, it's, it's not included in the short version that I gave you. Uh, we have the classic scene where the doctor comes by the baby's bedside and shakes his head like, oh, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. So we know that the baby is sick. We know that from later on in the film, but we can, you know, take that knowledge and put it forward. Now, here is the scene, you know, where they are taking her baby away from her. Here, this is the part where I mentioned you can see Violet very clearly say, like, wait, wait, it was right, right before that. She says, no, you know, here, let's just, let's just show that just for the, the, the easy, easy lip sync of uh, hearing her go, nope, here it comes, take the baby and nope. <laughs> so um, now the moment here that I want to point out is that Violet throughout this scene is refusing to give up the baby. Marion comes and she stands up to her. She refuses to give up her child. So Marion, having failed, looks off screen and says something, makes a disdainful gesture to Violet. Disdainful gesture, says something. So basically what I have there, and, and of course, right after that, Chinsi enters the frame. The intertitle that I put there is she asks Chin Si to come forward and help her because she refuses to give up the child. You know, things like that. Like you're just you're just watching what they're doing and reporting on it. Um, now, this was the part that really that I really struggled with. Chin Si says something, and all of a sudden Violet gives up the baby. What could you say to a mother to make her agree all of a sudden to give up her child after she's just fought so hard to keep her? And since we know later from the doctor visit scene that the reason why they're taking the baby from her is probably because the baby is ill. The line that I gave Chin Si here is something to the effect of, you know, if we do nothing, your baby will die. We have to try the one thing we haven't tried, which is to take it away from you. And Violet, you know, being a good mother, acquiesces reluctantly and hates it and begs but that is basically, you know, and, and of course, in, in, in this particular shot, you can clearly say her, you see her say, oh, no, oh, please, you know, and, and I put that into the uh, title card. So that's that basically in a in a lightning round short version so that we can pop over to questions is effectively how I went through this film scene by scene, frame for frame, starting with the the meat and potatoes, most emotional 
moments, you know, uh, clarifying the meaning of that in my mind and then going back and fleshing out all the littler scenes that fill it in, you know, and, and with those things in mind, I was able to, to see things that weren't obvious before, like Marion Wong's, like, you know, marginal villainy, like even when it's like a shot of all of them, you can see Marion Wong, like, you know, doing tiny little villain things throughout. And so when you highlight those with intertitles and bring them to the audience's attention, you get a coherent piece overall. And with that, we can go to questions. Yeah, well, why don't we take the uh, question from Denise Mock down because we've already thanked Denise for volunteering. She's at the University of Toronto. And then you answered the have you look for a script and the panel being recorded. The availability question I'll say is that we do plan, but we have to go through a release signing for all of the participants and the cutting and it will be some time. So you wanna take Shuli, Nancy, and Christine, those three questions for your panelists, Cordelia. Let's see. For me, the marrying character could also be the sister-in-law, right? An evil sister-in-law uh, is also a common trope, like what happened in Yu Mei-An's story I presented this morning. Ah, I, I, there are later parts of the film that make me think otherwise, but uh, possible? I mean, anything is, is possible. Like we said, if we get a Cantonese speaker who can read lips, you know, uh, if, if Denise can take a look at this uh, and either confirm or deny that, you know, I'm, I'm willing to go with whatever is true. <laughs> um, all right. That's let's... what we tried to do as a family too, whatever was the truth. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like we, this, there's, there's no ego in this. We're, we're looking for facts. All right. Um, Nancy asks, is there a possibility or of influence from Cantonese opera? Opera was a very, very popular, both in Southern China, Shanghai and Chinatown. It was an important influence on the culture and the norm. Has there been work in exploring this connection? Greg, do you want to answer that? And the answer is a definite yes. My family was so into Cantonese opera that even though we uh, lived in Berkeley, we would cross uh, uh, the Bay Bridge and go to San Francisco Chinatown to the three theaters and there was one on Grand Avenue that we would go to. And I talked to my aunts, who of course are a generation ahead of me, and they were taken there as children. And then I was taken there as children. And I, my, and I couldn't stand it, but I went to have the treats, you know, um, and that's why I, did, I supported my grandmother as a child of going. Uh, but uh, that was definitely so. And we had relatives that were part of the touring groups of Cantonese opera, in which they even stored costumes and props in the garage of the house. And unfortunately, uh, my cousins and I and uncle, when we were kids, we found the spears and stuff. And I think you know what we did with them. Oh my goodness. Oh, all right. That's, that's very cool. Oh my goodness. It looks like we lost Yanfi, unfortunately. Um, but thankfully, the next question is also for Greg. So uh, it's so intriguing question for Gregory. When you first saw the prince from Violet and Marion, and then when they were first brought to LA for preservation, neither included any intertitles, or were there a few and others were lost? Never. Even the very first oh. time viewing it in 1973, there were no intertitles. In fact, it was very similar to what you just saw. And that's why many of us were lost a little bit, as well as the gaps with missing reels. But I do want to say, I talked to one of my aunts who remembers the 1948 showing at the Elmwood Theater in Berkeley. And she told me, in fact, it was just yesterday. Uh, she said there was music that accompanied and there were subtitles. She, she used the term subtitles, but may have been inner titles. Yeah. But it was there. So we just don't have the right prints. It, it, exactly. And, and actually that, that uh, answers one of the holy grail questions that we had, because if you will see the, the footage, which I will link to momentarily, I promise. Uh, basically, uh, there are, it, it starts off with two title cards, the, the only surviving uh, text in the film is the intro title, The Curse of Guangdong, uh, When the Far East Mingles with the West. Boom. 
and then it goes away and then it comes back with like a handful of incense coming down and then it lights on fire and disappears and we were baffled by that Yanfi and I talked about that like, like why why does this happen why do you see, like what film has two title cards and Greg explained well like you know uh, his, his his aunt who had seen the original version and confirmed that you know yes there were intertitles yes they were in English uh, which matches the title card he was the one who said oh well that's because this is the editor's working copy this is not the finished film this is you know like and and as a filmmaker I immediately got it I was like right because if I was filming a title plate that then had to be set on fire and destroyed I would want to film it twice one you know to make sure that the image is captured so that we have it and then again in which it, it, it get, catches fire and gets destroyed just in case that shot doesn't turn out well and we'll just use the other one you know uh, I think because the second shot turned out well she most likely in the finished film used the one where the, the hand of incense and you know the, the fire happens but we included both in our print restoration because I, I like you know we're, we're missing so much footage I didn't want to take any of it away <laughs> um all right let's see uh what else do we have all right so people asked about the book which I answered in the comments um yes the, the, the reference book is James Naramore's acting in the cinema you can see it on the schedule with the further reading if you go to program one on the website you'll be able to see it's like it's full bibliography um and uh yes I will be giving the link so stay tuned at the end of this panel I will give it to you right before we sign off uh what else do we have uh, adding to what Julie noted about the evil sister-in-law trope, there is also the common trope in 1920s, 30s Chinese film of a knife or rope being thrown to the floor before a young woman when she was suspected for being unfaithful. Oh, I wonder if that may be relevant in this case. Greg, you had said that your original interpretation of this film before seeing mine had to do with uh, Violet being unfaithful. Do you want to... Uh, right. I thought that was, so to speak, the cause of the curse is uh, Marion's character was saying that that's not my, um, not Hart of Harvey's the name of the actor. Um, uh, he's not the father, it must be somebody else. Yeah. Uh, and Which that's what I thought. And also one more comment on the Cantonese opera. Uh, I think the influence on the family was actually after Curse of Guangdong, uh, more into the 1920s and 30s. So I'm not sure how much Marion was influenced by Cantonese opera, you know, between 1912 and 1915. Yeah, and uh, when it comes to the question of, of infidelity, um, again, we are missing the two reels right before uh, Violet gets kicked out of the house. So we are, we are missing the direct information as to why she gets kicked out. Um, I think it is, you know, maybe possible that it has to do with infidelity, but considering like, like looking only at the footage that we have after it, looking only at the end, you know, one of the big questions that I asked myself is, well, what is the curse of Guangdong? Like what, what is the thing that the, the, the bad thing that happens to this family, you know, you see in press releases from the time of this film, it says, oh, like a, a Chinese family is uh, afflicted with the curse for, you know, having become too westernized. That is literally what it says. And looking at it, the only really bad thing that happens in the movie that is outside of the human's control is the fact that the baby gets ill and is about to die. Uh, and that, you know, is what I sort of took. I was like, well, that's got to be the curse because everything else that happens is clearly not a curse. It's clearly like like a, a human choice to, you know, to kick Violet out of the house or, you know, whatever else happens. I won't give you spoilers. Uh, but but basically that, um, that, that uh, I think, especially because of how much time is lavished on Violet's difference, Violet's hair especially as a symbol of her difference of her americanness and taking that in conjunction with the plot descriptions that we have inherited from contemporary newspapers and press releases it really does look like the curse in question is her being punished for her western ways not so much for uh you know any suspected infidelity then again if we discover missing reels that disconfirm that, I'm willing to accept it. Um, all right, let's see who else. Okay, we're, uh, Cord Cordelia, we need to wrap. Wrap it up. Let's come to the end and make sure that Greg saw the 
special link message to him from Nancy Rao. All right, in that and case. Thank you. And so, uh, so we're going to right. thank our panelists and promise the link because we've got incredible enthusiasm for seeing the entire restoration. Restoration number how many? <laughs> All right. So infinite restoration on this particular title. Yes, so I have just dropped the link in the there chat it is. twice. Uh, if we didn't get to your questions, my apologies. Uh, you can reach me at Saporin at fdu.edu, which I will also put there. Um, and uh, that is all that I have to say. Thank you so much for your interest and enthusiasm. And I hope that you enjoy watching the film again, which will only be up until tomorrow evening when oh, the evening. Uh, conference is over. So watch it now before it goes away. And